I have received an order not to correct Jeff Dunn anymore. <laughs> the order came directly from Jeff Dunn. So I won't. If I can think of any reason to praise him, I will. So let me, since I can't think of anything, let me instead praise Paul Andrew Hutton. Now, historians sometimes have friendly rivalries. Some historians are frenemies. The, the late Tom Lindley and I were frenemies for many, many years. Same with Bill Groneman, the other side of the Crockett uh, dialogue. Um, my envy of Paul Hutton is more than anything else. When I turn on the TV randomly, he's there. And he's speaking in almost perfect script. Uh, he, he, he's not reading from notes. He's looking at the, either the camera or the interlocutor. And he's saying exactly what needs to be said um, and then stops at exactly the right time and completes the thought almost perfectly. Um, that makes me really angry uh, <laughs> when I see some, someone doing it that well. Um, Paul is a distinguished professor of history. Those are capitalized. It means it's real. Uh, at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque. He is a cultural historian, a military historian, um, a documentary writer, and as I've suggested, a television personality. Um, he's won some awards six times each. That's just not fair. <laughs> no es justo. Um, but um, I will forgive him today. Um, Paul has written uh, some of his best stuff uh, about Davy Crockett. He, like I, like Jim Boylston and other authors uh, who've written about Davy Crockett, are real Davy Crockett fans. Because the more you get into the life and, uh, of the real Davy Crockett, the more you appreciate the man. Although the, fir the person, my co-author, although we only briefly met one time, Dan Kilgore, uh, my co-author on the book, How Did Davy Die and Why Do We Care So Much? Um, uh, Dan Kilgore came late in his life to understand that the mythic Davy Crockett is more important than the real Davy Crockett to historians. Why? Why is the mythic Davy Crockett more important to historians than the real Davy Crockett? It's because the impact of the mythic Davy Crockett on how people think and how people act, and therefore on history, is greater than any impact of the real Davy Crockett, the one we have to find in the documents and in the, and in the tattered fragments from the past. That mythic Crockett has been enormously important. It's what got some of us into the business of doing history. It was the mythic Crockett that sparked it, as Steve Harrigan said today. So Paul Hutton, uh, my frenemy from New Mexico, there's always been a rivalry between Texas and New Mexico. They used to have part of us, and we used to have part of them and no one agrees on where the border ought to be. It's the only border, by the way, I'll take one more minute of Paul's time. It's the only border that can, except rivers and things like that, that can be, some, that can be seen from outer space. Why is that true? It's because of the legal systems of the two. The more communitarian Hispanic heritage of New Mexico means they limit on how much water you can pump out of the ground. And so the green circles that you might be able to see from outer space where you have great irrigation wheels are far more few and far between in New Mexico than they are on the other side of that imaginary line where they follow Texas law, which is called the law of the biggest pump. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you beggar your neighbors by pumping all that water out. Uh, it doesn't matter if you make half of the suburbs around the San Jacinto battlefield sink because you've pumped all the water out. It's your right because you're an individual. 
And those are two very different legal systems and two very different cultural heritages. And uh, Paul is good about writing history and understanding the cultural dimensions of what these people are engaged in, both who create the history and then those who write about the history. Please welcome Paul Andrew Hutton. This microphone work? Yes, it does. I can hear my echo. That border, by the way, we're pretty particular about it over there in New Mexico. Um, folks from Texas kept coming over to New Mexico and trying to establish their uh, rule over New Mexico. And we would spank them and send them back to Texas and they would build statues to their heroes. And we're happy to do that. They never were able to conquer us until, of course, Indian casinos and uh, ski resorts went in, and now it's all Texas all the time. We love Texans in New Mexico, of course. Well, who doesn't love Texans? I'm not really a New Mexican. I'm a hybrid from all over the world. And uh, the four years I spent going from the first grade through the fourth grade in San Angelo, Texas, were the key moments of my life, obviously and thus led to the talk I'm going to give you today. Now listen, kids, um, if you want to learn history, uh, you go to the library, OK? And uh, maybe you will and maybe you won't from some of the books you might read. If you want to be entertained, go to the movies. It's a three-act play, and uh, except the way Harrigan writes them for uh, television movies. He stole my line. I, I just got to tell you. Uh, following Steve Harrigan is kind of a challenge in the first place, but uh, then that he stole my line, uh, my favorite line he ever wrote, which actually brings right here a little tear to my eye. <laughs> Sorry about your library. <laughs> Sorry. Magnificent. Just, <laughs> just incredible. Timothy Dalton, James Bond. Yeah, so proud of you. <laughs> to try to find historical accuracy in a film is a, at best, delightful parlor game, and at uh, worst, a fool's errand. Um, it is drama, and it is not, uh, it is not history. Uh, all Westerns, though, and uh, all Davy Crockett films are Westerns, uh, all Westerns carry a sense of historicity with them. And uh, they make us uh, think that they're set in a believable past. And that's kind of the key to any film, is to create a believable world that, whether it's real or not, we buy into it, whether it's... Uh, um, Custer's Last Stand or the Alamo or orcs charging against that castle in Lord of the Rings. I mean, it's the, it's the drama that has to compel us. And certainly, Davy Crockett's life was uh, full of drama. He was uh, a person who was sort of in show business while he was alive. He was actually, in many ways, this is something we're very familiar with today, and in fact, whole cable channels are devoted to it, uh, but he was the first American to make a living off being a celebrity. As a farmer, as a, as a congressman, his record was pretty sketchy, to say, uh, to say the least. But as a celebrity, uh, in his own lifetime, he was off the charts. Let's see if I can get this to work. No, it's pointing it at myself. I'll try it the other way. My, um, my daughter helped me to learn the mysteries of PowerPoint. This is my very first personally crafted PowerPoint presentation. I'm very proud of it. Um, there's 100 slides in it. She informed me there's no way you can do 100 slides uh, in 40 minutes. I said, honey, you just, uh, you just watch. You'll see. Um, and uh, I guess we will. Um, there is, of course, the real Colonel Crockett, Alexa de Tocqueville, 
in 1831 uh, wrote of Colonel Crockett. He said, two years ago, the inhabitants of the district of which Memphis is the capital sent to the House of Representatives in Congress an individual named David Crockett, who has no education, can read with difficulty, has no property, no fixed residence, but passes his life hunting, selling his game to live, and dwelling continuously in the woods. His competitor, a man of wealth and talent, failed. Well, Mr. de Tocqueville, being French, of course, was shocked by this. We, being Americans, understand that, you know, God bless this country, anyone can rise to high political office. <laughs> yeah, make up your own joke. Uh, and isn't that great, too? Because it really doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you're on. You have that opinion about uh, one person or another. Um, an 1831 newspaper report called Crockett, quote, an object of universal notoriety, and reported that to, quote, return from the capital without having seen Colonel Crockett betrayed a total destitution of curiosity and a perfect insensibility to the lions of the West. And indeed, uh, Crockett was already famous in his own time um, because of the books uh, written about him and because of then uh, he was horrified when a book became kind of a bestseller that was written about him. So he wrote his own autobiography, which is one of the classics of American uh, autobiography. And, uh, and uh, also uh, 50 of these uh, penny dreadful um, Crockett almanacs uh, appeared in the years uh, that uh, he was both alive and after his, uh, after his death. And uh, they eventually became uh, mouthpieces for manifest destiny and for the idea that American institutions um, would uh, overspread the continent, uh, what Thomas Jefferson had called uh, the great continent an empire for liberty. And uh, after Crockett, of course, had been defeated in Congress and had gone off to the Alamo, his image shifted from that of the symbol of the common man, along with Andrew Jackson, to uh, a martyr to our manifest destiny, a martyr to our continental destiny to become a great nation uh, at the expense, of course, of others. Um, there was a play written in 1831 by James K. Paulding, future Secretary of the Navy. And uh, Paulding had uh, won a prize offered by James Hackett, a famous Shakespearean actor of the time, most famous for his role as Falstaff. Uh, and um, Hackett had wanted to, um, wanted a purely American play. And so um, Paulding wrote The Lion of the West. Um, and the Lion of the West was Colonel Nimrod Wildfire, a Kentucky congressman who, uh, uh, intervenes uh, when a young lady is being denied her right to marry the man of her choice and being forced to uh, marry uh, not just, an, not just a, a feat aristocrat, but I, I believe he was from England, of all things. And uh, he intervenes and saves her while giving out great wisdom to, uh, to the crowd as you see here. Uh, and that is the image of James Hackett as Colonel Nimrod uh, Wildfire. And just so you, um, you understand that uh, show business has been influence, influencing uh, history from the very beginning. Here, of course, is the early Davy Crockett Almanac, which you see uh, he's wearing that wildcat skin on his head. And indeed, that is uh, that's James Hackett, that's not Davy Crockett. So from the very beginning, this is the almanac that came out the year uh, of Crockett's death. Um, he, was, uh, he was in the show business. Well, after Crockett uh, uh, died, Americans constructed, of course, a great, uh, a great myth around him. He, of course, exemplified the important values of his day, and this was one of the reasons for his fame. His generation faced uh, the future without the guidance of the Founding Fathers, and they, uh, they looked for new heroes. They looked for a new sense of American uh, exceptionalism and identity, and they found it in the heroes of the American West. And Davy Crockett inherited the mantle of Daniel Boone and now became the representative of the West. And men like Davy Crockett and Sam Houston, William Henry Harrison, Henry Clay, 
uh, later Abraham Lincoln were seen as men of the West who were masters of their destiny and who could do anything and accomplish uh, anything. And from them, Americans derived a sense of who they were as, uh, as a people. And um, they really, um, through the conquest of the West, they affirmed that Americans were indeed uh, uh, masters of their own universe. And uh, it represented the triumph of democracy uh, for its leaders were common men who had made their fortunes with hard work and determination. And the aristocracy of Europe and the uh, tidewater of Virginia and New England now was swept aside in the rise of Jackson and the, and the heroes of the West. And Davy Crockett was uh, central to that. Well, of course, after the Civil War, though, new Western heroes arose, and uh, Crockett uh, sort of faded. He faded. Uh, part of that was just the new heroes had six guns, and there was automated killing, and of course, the uh, single-shot muskets uh, of uh, Crockett's time didn't work as well in the dime novels that were written about Wild Bill Hickok and Buffalo Bill and Billy the Kid. Um, and of course, they don't work in Hollywood movies either, and sometimes they just give everybody six shooters. What the hell? You know. Uh, but there was a play, a play um, written by Frank Murdoch uh, entitled Davy Crockett. It premiered on Broadway in June of 1873 with Frank Mayo as the title character. And there is Frank and his co-star Laura Dawn. And it was a typical kind of Victorian romance and Davy Crockett is uh, his uh, uh, childhood sweetheart returns from the East with her, uh, again, the same plot as Lion of the West, uh, uh, a feet Eastern aristocratic uh, fiance, and Davy is of course crestfallen. You see, they're holding his forehead, holding his brow in pain over losing Laura Dawn. Uh, and um, I'm so proud, by the way, that I actually not only have the program from that film that you saw before, but have managed, managed to find these two cabinet cards as well. Just sometimes in the morning, I, ju I just get up and I say a little prayer of thanks for eBay. I just don't know how I would uh, even function as a human without it. Uh, uh, my wife knows how we might function you know, financially without it, but nevertheless. Um, uh, it premiered on Broadway in June of 1873, and in it, um, in it uh, Davy Crockett uh, um, scoops away his, uh, his bride from the uh, horrors of uh, this marriage and carries her off on his horse uh, and the climax of the, uh, of the play, which everyone just loved. And, and who wouldn't? Uh, well, Frank Mayo didn't love it. Uh, he hated the role. It typecast him. He could play nothing else. He did over 3,000 performances and kept trying to quit. But of course, audiences demanded Davy Crockett. And um, he played it until he died in 1896. And then his son played it. Uh, and his son went on to actually be a silent film uh, star and uh, star in movies with John that directed by John Ford. And his last movie was, in fact, he had a bit part in the They Died With Their Boots On, the 1941 Errol Flynn Custer epic that uh, Warner Brothers released. So there's a wonderful connection between uh, uh, the plays. And, and um, Frank Mayo was uh, marketed, and he could get cigars. He could get a school tablet, and the school tablet celebrates the most important scene in the play, which is where the uh, they have sought refuge in a cabin, and they're being chased by wolves in a storm. And, uh, and um, the uh, idiot Easterner, fiance of uh, Davy's girlfriend, uh, uses the bolt from the door to start a fire. He's such a moron. Uh, and so Davy has to stay there all night, which allows him to spend the night with the girl and not do anything bad, all night with his arm barring the door, and you see the wolves trying to peek there. This was, uh, this was high drama in 1871. Uh, and uh, here are a couple, of, there he is barring the door again. Uh, and so the people who started making silent movies, well, this is what they'd grown up on. They'd grown up on this play. They'd grown up on Buffalo Bill, they'd grown up on this play. It was so, uh, so incredibly uh, popular, and look, just like Fess Parker, Frank Mayo had his own song. There's Davy Crockett's March. And notice that his headgear is getting better. Now it's a little fox. It's not a big wildcat like Nimrod Wildfire had. And of course, we're going to keep going down the food chain of animals till we get to that coonskin cap. Uh, 
Well, uh, Mayo's son had turned to silent films, and of course, uh, silent films soon discovered Davy Crockett. And the first two that were made um, were in 1909 and 1910. Charles French, um, who went on to have a very long career in, in uh, Hollywood, uh, played Davy Crockett in Davy Crockett Hearts United in 1909. And, uh, Hobart uh, Bosworth, who you've probably never heard of, but who you've seen countless times because he was in like 300 movies well into the sound age, um, also then was in a, in a Davy Crockett uh, one-reeler. And both of these are the Frank Mayo play. They they're both just did the Frank Mayo play. Um, so indeed, uh, Davy Crockett uh, was uh, right on the screen from the very beginning. Uh, the first Alamo film, is, as we've discussed uh, already, was the 1911 film, The Immortal Alamo. Um, uh, synopsis of the film survived, even though the film does not. It appears that there was no Davy Crockett character in it, but if you look closely, you can see a guy wearing a dead animal on his head there in the background. Uh, so maybe that was, uh, maybe that was Davy. Um, a siege and fall of the Alamo in uh, 19... Uh, 14, though, had A.D. Sears as uh, a very uh, kind of good-looking Davy there. And uh, in, this, uh, in this film, uh, which was done very cheaply, but was actually filmed in San Antonio and filmed on the par partially filmed on the grounds of the Alamo, there you see Davy has met, uh, has met his fate. Um, and that's all we know of, uh, of this excellent uh, of this excellent representation of our hero. Now, there's a problem, you know, with doing um, the uh, story. I'm sorry, the actor in that previous film was unknown. A.D. Sears is in uh, Martyrs of the Alamo. Um, the problem with Alamo films, of course, um, is that um, we know how it ends. Uh, and, of course, um, since the Alamo is such a powerful and iconic symbol in American history, uh, we might expect numerous cell celluloid versions of this epic tale, but indeed there, there have been less than 20. And many of these, you know, the Alamo is just tangential to the story. Uh, if you think, uh, not to bring up New Mexico again, but of course, you know, you, you folks here have, you know, Davy Crockett, Sam Houston, Stephen Austin. Well, huh, we got Billy the Kid. Uh, and we're very proud of our state criminal. And... Um, <laughs> 75 movies made about Billy the Kid, so that kind of puts things in context for you, I guess, what, uh, what sells juvenile delinquency as opposed to heroic stands for democracy. Um, now, the Alamo poses special problems for Hollywood, uh, which limits its appeal. It's a static story in which the protagonists are trapped in a walled enclosure uh, for, and forced, of course, constantly to react to the enemy rather than take the action uh, to them, although in in most in the big Alamo movies, they go out of the fort, you know, which is the last thing you would want to do. Um, some suspense can be derived from the hope for assistance, but of course, you already know nobody's coming to the Alamo. Since the well, we used to all know no one was coming to the Alamo. I mean, I'm, I was actually surprised in Texas Rising that they didn't win the Battle of the Alamo. Um, <laughs> Harrigan was so kind to that that move, that film on the History Channel. Um, uh, since the ending is preordained, little movement is possible. Uh, the pressures on the screenwriter are uh, formidable, um, and the problem and the end result is that most Alamo movies fail, both critically and uh, and uh, commercially with the exception of Walt Disney's version, which really only deals with the Alamo and less than a third of the story. Um, this film, The Martyrs of the Alamo, released in 1915, um, was actually uh, restored because it was discovered by a graduate student from the University of Texas in 1977. And they, he combined it with what the American Film Institute had in Washington. And so we actually have this uh, delightful film. It was made by D.W. Griffith's Triangle Film Corporation. And it reflects, as uh, Frank mentioned earlier, the same breathtaking racism that so marks uh, Griffith's classic birth of a uh, 
nation. I love you know, Griffith indeed. Uh, um, Professor Crisp's new book is, uh, is based on that Griffith, on that um, Woodrow Wilson quote, you know, history written with lightning. And of course, he's talking about birth of a nation, you know, where the Ku Klux Klan rides to the rescue. And so it's, it, I think they used it when they were like stripping uh, his name off of various uh, uh, school buildings back east. Uh, now he's not, uh, because he was such a terrible racist, he's not quite the darling of the left that he used to be. But he did, he did say that. Um, well, this film has the same unfortunate racial mentality. Um, According to Martyrs, the Texas Revolution was almost solely caused by the insults and crude advances made by lascivious Mexicans on the chaste white women who had settled with their brave fathers and husbands in Texas. Santa Ana, as you saw so vividly earlier, is played by a leering, drooling, bug-eyed Walter Long. Walter Long had portrayed uh, a vicious black soldier in Griffith's Birth of a Nation, so he had the bug-eyed drool thing down just uh, perfectly. Um, and his sole uh, pursuit in life seemed to be uh, blondes and opium. No wonder he was president. Um, <laughs> I don't know why you laugh. He, he was particularly smitten with the fiance of the film's hero, Silent Smith, played by Sam DeGraff. And Smith was a fictional version, of course, of. Uh, of Deaf uh, Smith, or Deaf Smith, depending upon what part of the world you're from. Um, well, um, it really is a, uh, a uh, epic tale, and it does indeed feature all of the heroes, and it is available uh, to, uh, uh, to see today, which is remarkable for these old silent films. Um, in 1916, Davy Crockett returned, though, in uh, uh, a film about the great hero, and this time it was Dustin Hoffman, uh, Dustin Hoffman in my dreams. Uh, but to recover from that faux pas, let me just say that Dustin Hoffman, yes, was named for Dustin Farnham. He was indeed. Uh, it's, it, it's on Google, it must be true. Um, <laughs> Dustin Farnham had so starred in The Squaw Man uh, for DeMille, uh, The Virginian, Flaming Frontier, he played General Custer. So here he is as Davy Crockett. That's a twofer in my world. Um, and uh, this was just simply another version of the Murdoch play. Uh, it was produced by Palace uh, Pictures and Film near Big Bear Lake, northeast of, uh, of Los Angeles. And there he is with Winifred Kingston, uh, the great silent film actress now forgotten by all. Uh, I have no idea who, who she was. Um, well, this film uh, advanced uh, his career and uh, he, you see, is already wearing that coonskin cap. A lot of people believe for some reason that the coonskin cap was an invention of the Disney movie, and that's what made everyone think that Davy wore a coonskin cap. Uh, there is uh, evidence from uh, his lifetime that he did uh, by contemporary uh, folk, and of course, uh, usually you wore those kind of hats when it was cold, to keep your head warm, uh, which is the reason for headgear. Uh, but it became a symbol for him, much like Benjamin Franklin had worn that fur hat in uh, Paris and had, had uh, delighted the court of Versailles. It showed that you were a natural man. You were part of uh, the wilderness uh, itself. So actually, headgear is important. Headgear says everything. Uh, and I'm looking out at the crowd. I'm checking your headgear right now. Um, it's changed in our, think how it's changed in our own lifetime. Uh, with Davy Crockett at the fall of the Alamo, uh, starred silent film heartthrob Cullen Landis. And uh, he made a uh, brave and stirring Davy. This film also uh, survives, not all of it, but uh, in the beginning we see Davy in his congressman attire and then he puts on his, his Davy Crockett outfit and heads west to Texas to, uh, to join uh, with the uh, with the Texans and their struggle for ind independence. And um, since the death of Davy is, is such an important historical issue, in this one he dies swinging a saber. And uh, when they finally kill him, he has a smile on his face as he, uh, as he perishes. And this was a, a film by Anthony Zaitis, who was Zidius, who was a uh, producer at the time. Sunset Pictures brought it out. 
And he did a series of films on Western heroes. He did Daniel Boone, he did uh, uh, General Custer uh, as well. And it was directed by uh, Robert Bradbury, who had quite a distinguished uh, uh, career. Now, the Alamo was absent from the screen for over a decade after uh, Cullen Landis's performance. By, uh, sound had a real impact on Westerns. Uh, the sound equipment was so bulky and heavy, it was hard to take it on location, do outdoor shots, and all that sort of thing. Uh, by the late 1920s, the Western had declined to such a state. Uh, it was mostly B-Westerns. The singing cowboy was coming on. That's what sound brought us. Uh, Gene Autry became the biggest Western star by 1939. Um, and also during the Depression, no one had any money, and so there wasn't money enough for a big production like, uh, like the Alamo. This was the era of the inexpensive B-Western. So it was not until 1939, after the success of John Ford's Stagecoach, that interest was renewed in big budget uh, Westerns, and many of these were historical. Uh, thus, the Alamo or Alamo Heroes turned up only three times in the 30s, and the 1937 serial, The Painted Stallion, the budget Western Heroes of the Alamo, and My Man of Conquest in 1939. Um, Heroes of the Alamo, released by Columbia in 1937, was made on an extremely small budget and focused more on talk than on action, which is kind of what all the Alamo movies have to do because you're stuck in a building for 13 days. And what are you going to do when you're stuck in a building? We're going to talk about it. I think we're in trouble. Yes, you're right. We're in big trouble. Help's going to come. Oh, sure they will. No, no, they're not coming. No. Uh, anyway, so, uh, and certainly that was the kind of dialogue that went on in Heroes of the Alamo. Uh, Anthony Zidius was the producer of this as well, so we owe him a debt of gratitude. Interestingly, the film concentrates on Almeron Dickinson, played by Bruce Warren, and his wife, called Anne, she always gets her name changed in these movies, um, Anne um, and uh, Crockett Bowie are, and Travis are not the central characters. Um, Bowie, Travis, and Crockett are, though, featured prominently. Lane Chandler, who's one of these B-Western actors, played, uh, played Davy Crockett, who's a decidedly secondary character in the film. Uh, Bowie, played by Roger Williams, is presented as a, here, here they all are, is presented as an uncouth frontier lout and rabble rouser who is anxious for war with Mexico. Travis, played by Rex Leach, is uh, presented as a soft-spoken, cultured man of the law. Uh, who cautions against rash actions as war clouds uh, uh, gather. Uh, but mostly it features on the uh, romance between uh, the Dickinson. And Mrs. Dickinson uh, won't leave the Alamo. She won't leave, and she gives her husband a lecture on what it's all about. So this is kind of an early example of gender equality in uh, motion pictures. You see, they're pushing the boundaries, pushing the boundaries of what film can be. She says to him when he says, you must go, you must take our baby and go. No, no, she says, I am a Texas woman. I couldn't sit at home. I'll nurse the men, I'll do anything, but I won't leave. Whatever happens to us, Texas will go on. A Texas so great, so wonderful. In the years to come, then you and I can't even imagine it. But without us, without the Alamo, that Texas never could be. Its life will be our lives. Oh, I just, tissue, anyone have tissue, please? Uh, that's all right. Um, anyway, uh, you get the drift. Um, uh, but it is unusual to uh, so concentrate on, uh, uh, on her as a, uh, as a character. Oh, I skipped right through, I had, there we go. Uh, Davy Crockett has a very small role in the film, and his death is very odd. He's like wounded, and uh, he groans, and a Mexican soldier bashes his head in. That's kind of the end of it. It's kind of the saddest Davy Indy. Uh, but here, before, before the big battle, uh, he pulls out his fiddle, and along with Jim Bowie there, and even though he's sick, he could still sing, they sang the Yellow Rose of Texas. Just <laughs> What you say, The Yellow Rose of Texas hadn't been written yet? Oh, please, come on. Uh, just great moment. The Painted Stallion in 1937 was a 12-part uh, 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 
uh, action serial with Jack uh, Perrin as Davy Crockett. He's the one uh, there at the very end in the dark uh, buckskin outfit. And um, this was followed by The Fall of the Alamo, that inexpensive little film shot in uh, San Antonio uh, that Frank talked about earlier. And there you see uh, what is obviously the Davy Crockett character with his uh, coonskin tail flowing uh, uh, behind him as he looks out at all of those uh, Mexican soldiers. Um, Republic Studios, best known for budget westerns, produced the only large-scale Alamo tale in the 1937, in, uh, in the 1930s, and that was the 1939 film Man of Conquest with Richard Dix. And it follows the career of Sam Houston from the War of 1812 uh, through uh, San Jacinto and uh, to the death of Andrew Jackson. Uh, much of the film, though, concerns Houston's adventures in, uh, in Texas. And there he meets up, he sneaks across the border, refusing to take an oath of allegiance to Mexico, and, uh, and uh, meets Davy Crockett, Robert Barrett, and Jim Bowie, Robert Armstrong, and helps them uh, uh, battle uh, Comanches. And, there's, and this is kind of a nice uh, Davy Crockett image, because you see he's, he's, he's got the dead animal on his head, but he's also wearing a tie. So this is kind of a compromise between rugged frontiersman and congressman. He's, he's a conflicted character. And um, it's very funny. They talk about, uh, in, in the conversation they have in this scene that you see here, they talk about uh, the agricultural uh, possibilities. Because usually when you're besieged by Comanches at a cabin, you want to talk about agriculture. And, uh, and Crockett says, well, you know, uh, it's pretty good land, but it's got all this black goo oozing up everywhere. You know, so it's just. Oh, Davy, should have bought oil futures. Uh, and of course, uh, the Battle of the Alamo is done briefly, but actually very well. And of course, indeed, along with Frank, I, I share the, the absolute, I'm just in ecstasy when I watch the hump blown off the Alamo right at the climax of the battle. It's just everything's in reverse. Um, um, and there they are battling away, and it's all in the chapel. It's all kind of, they're all fighting in the tra chapel, and each hero dies, uh, dies gallantly. There is uh, Victor Jory was, uh, was Colonel Travis, and there you see him about to meet his end. Uh, there's Jim Bowie uh, calmly dispatching uh, Mexican soldiers from his, uh, from his bed. And then my favorite, Davy Crockett, uh, uh, battling away. Now, many people have said, you know, historians have, have uh, spent a lot of time worrying about, God, how did the Mexicans sneak up on the Texans, you know? How is it possible that they, they got there so, uh, so silently? You know, I can't believe it, the uh, um, slide you're looking at is, um, is um, so uh, a little too high uh, because uh, in it, um, you can see that the Mexican officer who's about to kill Davy is wearing tennis shoes. That's how cheap the movie was. He's wearing, wearing tennis shoes. And that's how, the, that's, how they, that's how they snuck up on the Alamo, if you're wearing tennis shoes. No one could hear. And they were fast. They were fast. I always like that. All right. Um, well, Davy, uh, Davy wasn't done. He was represented by his son, Davy Jr. There was no Davy Jr. I mean, he had sons, but they weren't called Davy Jr. But he's represented by his son, Davy Jr., played by Wild Bill Elliott in the 1941 film, The Son of Davy Crockett from Columbia. And then he was represented by his nephew, George Montgomery, in Davy Crockett Indian Scout in 1915. And his name is Davy Crockett in this, but he's not, he's not the real Davy Crockett. And you kind of... It's kind of puzzling why they would why they would do that, but nevertheless, uh, nevertheless, they did. Uh, in 1953, Davy was back, and this time uh, played by Trevor Bardet, a very crusty Davy in uh, *The Man from the Alamo*, which is a really well done Bud Bodicher, uh, Glenn Ford western in which he plays uh, the Moses Rose character. So he leaves the Alamo, and. Um, uh, infiltrates the enemy, and uh, it turns out that it's it's uh, renegade Texans who are actually raiding the countryside and killing women and children, not the Mexican army. And and his uh, um, companion in this is a little Mexican boy that he's rescued. And so it's a uh, very early call for racial uh, justice. And a very interesting film. And the Alamo's got a real gritty. Uh, 
sense to it, and it's been, the little part of the battle is filmed uh, very well. And uh, it's the only film I've ever seen in which Davy, and historians debate whether he was called Davy or whether he was called David. Well, in this film, he's called Dave, <laughs> Dave Crockett. <laughs> so I think that solves the question. He was called Davy, by the way. And, uh, certainly, Andrew Jackson in his correspondence refers to him as Davy Crockett. Um, well, a man from the Alamo in 1953 uh, was followed in the same year by You Are There on CBS television with Fred Gwynn. Yes, Fred Gwynn of the Munsters. It dates you if you actually know the Munsters. Uh, Fred Gwynn of the Munsters played uh, Davy. Look, he looks pretty good, don't you think? And uh, he gets interviewed by Walter Cronkite. Uh, that was the conceit of the show. Walter Cronkite would be on at the great historical event. You were there. Now, Davey, what do you think your chances are? Pretty grim. Pretty, pretty grim, Walter. Pretty grim. Um, I don't write them. I just tell you about them. Um, well, uh, indeed, um, Disney is coming. Davey had obviously fallen on hard times, and he wasn't getting the kind. And there was actually a huge cultural debate over Davey. Constance Rourke and Richard Dorsen and other folklorists were like trying to elevate him as a clear sign that uh, American, uh, the American character and American popular culture all was derived from uh, the uh, American folk idiom. And Davey Crockett was their example that they used. And they were arguing uh, with the uh, protectors of American culture, like Henry James, uh, back east who were arguing that, no, no, everything comes from Europe and the Americans never came up with anything original. Well, uh, they won because of Walt Disney. And of course, uh, Walt Disney uh, brought Davy to a television. Um, now, this was a major coup for the struggling ABC television network when Disney decided to break with all of the other major studios and go over to television. And um, he had a show called Disneyland. His new program premiered in October 1954 in the Wednesday night slot from 7.30 to 8.30 on the little black and white televisions all across America, only three channels, uh, and everyone was watching. Uh, he wanted to do a series of adventures from history for the show, and he wanted characters like Johnny Appleseed, Bigfoot, Wallace, and Davy Crockett. Uh, by sheer chance, Crockett was the first tale selected, and on December the 15th, 1954, Davy Crockett, uh, um, let's see, uh, there's Uncle Walt and Mrs. Walt there with uh, Fess Parker, of course, um, and uh, Pat Hogan. Uh, so Davy Crockett, Indian fighter, aired on, in December of 54. It's followed by Davy Crockett Goes to Congress on January 16, 1955, and Davy Crockett at the Alamo on February 23, 1955, poignant date. And um, in those days, Disneyland uh, revolved. It did Tomorrowland and um, uh, Fantasyland and then in, in Frontierland, all, all which would be part of the new park he was building called Disneyland. And uh, the Davy Crockett show, of course, as you all know, was a sensation. Fez Parker is Crockett, Buddy Ebsen is his sidekick, Georgie Russell became overnight uh, stars, Disneyland became the most successful program on television and in television history to that time, and ABC became strong competition for the other networks. Interest in the Western was uh, revived and, and incredible wave of television horse operas followed for a decade. It was Davy Crockett that, in, that started the Western boom of the 1950s. Gunsmoke and, and Wyatt Earp came on the next year, and then they were followed. By 1959, there are uh, 40 shows in prime time, 40 Western shows in prime time, just all because of Davy. Um, Disneyland, of course, now became a huge destination for people, and uh, uh, here's the and uh, here's the Alamo as represented in uh, in that show. Um, the Ballad of Davy Crockett, as sung by future soap opera heartthrob Bill Hayes, uh, and I love this scene. Here is the camera set up for uh, Davy's fight with Bigfoot Mason, and then you see the way it looked on the final screen. But as you can see, and I love it. Everyone's got their shirts off, and I don't think they're trying to be beefcake. I think it was so hot and miserable there in the Smoky Mountains where they filmed this uh, that uh, they were just dying. Um, 
and uh, there's Davy uh, making his stand against the Indian Bill, which the real Davy really did. And uh, this, this uh, little television show is actually remarkably historically accurate, uh, all, thi all things considered. And uh, just did a nice job. And Fess Parker was just uh, perfection as, uh, as Davy Crockett. We didn't know what Davy Crockett was, was really like until Fess Parker told us what he was really like. And now we all know. Oh, yeah. Uh, here's Travis drawing his line in the dust. Uh, there's a tumbleweed there. I, I love the tumbleweeds in the clip Frank showed. Uh, you know that tumbleweed is, a ru is Russian thistle. It doesn't come into the United States until the uh, 1870s and 80s when it's brought over with Russian wheat for the Great Plains. And so every movie that shows a tumbleweed, every painting with a tumbleweed, every tumbleweed uh, before like 1875 is wrong. Okay, there's my, there's my, my fight for accuracy in, uh, in Western. But I love that tumbleweed. That's nice. Right there on the Alamo compound. And look at the set. The set is so wonderful. And here you see it again. It was all built on a soundstage. That's on a soundstage. And this uh, uh, TV show was just done on just no budget. And um, I just loved it. I thought it was all real. I just thought it was so, in so incredible. And so did millions of other uh, children. This comic book right here, there it is, um, and uh, this, is, this is not my copy that is signed by Fess Parker himself, uh, but this is a copy of it which both front and back cover. It was this comic book in 1956 that I read after having, re having moved to San Angelo, Texas from England, my dad was in the Air Force, um, that started me on my journey as a historian, and I mean it. I mean this comic book. I, I never saw the show. We were in England, so I didn't see the show. But uh, I read this book, and I went nuts, and I, and I just, uh, I still am. It's very sad. Uh, well, uh, here, of course, is the ballad of Davy Crockett. Let's sing along now all together. Born on a mountain top. No, OK, let's not. Um, Tom Blackburn wrote it as filler for the show. They hadn't actually filmed enough show for the, for the uh, uh, three-part segment, and so he wrote it as filler, and they had little, uh, little cartoons, and, and uh, uh, the song would be sung as filler to do narration. Well, Disney had, was in a really embarrassing situation because he had killed off, and I loved it. There's Davy Duck. Um, and uh, you could win a trip to Disneyland or a March play set of the Alamo. I don't know which would be better. Uh, with that, and uh, and of course, every conceivable effort uh, item was uh, uh, merchandised. Uh, raccoon tails selling at twenty-five cents per pound in nineteen fifty-four now jumped to five dollars a pound as the children of America demanded their very own coonskin caps. I mean, what a tragedy for the raccoons of America! Uh, this represented um, coonskin caps were the biggest merchandising item. Um, but some 300 other items were licensed by Disney to carry the Crockett label. And there you can see, uh, you can get a Polly Crockett outfit as easily as a Davy Crockett. The girls were involved in this all the way. Um, there were, of course, wallets, pajamas, pillows, bedspreads, baby shoes, toy soldier sets, underwear, games, lunch boxes, purses. Yes, everything was, uh, was available and all kinds of toy sets. Sh uh, shoes, and I have... Uh, uh, Wasted a great deal of my life and my fortune collecting all of these kinds of items. Again, thank you, eBay, uh, many of which were represented about a decade ago in a huge exhibit I did at the Bob Bullock uh, Texas State History Museum uh, on Davy Crockett, uh, which really they did a fabulous job with there at the Bullock. Uh, but indeed, you know, Davy was up, and, uh, and Disney had uh, killed him off. He tried to bring him back with Davy Crockett and the River Pirates, and, uh, and here's some more. Uh, merchandising. You can just see Davy Crockett ice cream. I mean, who wouldn't want that? Uh, that's tough to get, still frozen uh, today off eBay. Uh, and various versions of the, uh, various versions of the, uh, of the song. And there, there's the man himself. Uh, and of course, just like, just like Frank Mayo, typecast, completely destroyed, you know, any hope for a Hollywood career. He was a contender. He could have been somebody. And what did he get? A one-way ticket to Davy Crockettville. Yeah, and later he played Daniel Boone and, did, and made some money on that on television, but uh, he always had to wear a dead animal on his head. Um, well, he brought, uh, Disney brought Davy Crockett back and Davy Crockett and the River Pirates in December of 55 with Jeff York as Mike Fink uh, and uh, 
also Davy Crockett's keelboat race in November of, uh, of 55, but it was too late. And, uh, and uh, it, was, uh, it was all over. Davy was the biggest thing since Marilyn Monroe and Liberace declared the show business trade paper variety, but he pancaked, he laid a, bom a bomb. And so indeed, uh, a lot of the Davy merchandise was sold at cut rate prices. Not anymore, it's still, uh, it's still expensive, but, but I've noticed that as the baby boomer generation, my generation, uh, fades from the scene, uh, that the prices are going down. So if I can just outlive everybody else, yes, <laughs> I can have the most toys, absolutely. And bubblegum cards, it's obscene what those sell for in the original uh, wrapper. You know, that gum doesn't last. Gum doesn't <laughs> last. Uh, and, but, but the heritage is passed on. The heritage is passed on, and here's my son, Paul Andrew, uh, who, who is going to law school next year, and who this photo will haunt all the rest of his days, dressed in his full Davy Crockett outfit. And if you can imagine the pain that I had to go through to remove these things from the original boxes, and the original wrapping, but still I had to have this, uh, I had to have this picture of my boy as, uh, as Davy. Uh, it will shock you to know that he, actually could care less about Davy Crockett, it's <laughs> so sad. Um, you know, Fez Parker was their idol of that whole baby boomer generation. Uh, they thought only of him as Davy, and um, their teenage sisters might swoon over Elvis, but uh, they were captivated by Fez. He was tall and handsome, strong and brave. Uh, more importantly, he always stood for truth and justice, and when he fought the Creek Indians, he worked not to spill blood, but to, uh, but to end the war. Of course, he had to fight a tomahawk duel with uh, Pat Hogan's uh, red stick to, uh, to end the war. But nevertheless, uh, he talked about the brotherhood of man and the golden rule that you should never kill. When he went to Congress, he fought for the rights of the underprivileged and the downtrodden, and the real Davy did, finally sacrificing his chance to be president to defend the rights of the Indians, and the real Davy did. Uh, then he went to Texas to offer a helping hand to folks who were fighting for their freedom, and the real, real Davy did. I mean, this guy is just too cool for school. Um, well, even when they grew up, they never forgot Davy Crockett. Little wonder that when handsome John Kennedy came along and spoke of the brotherhood of man and fought for the poor and the downtrodden and issued a clarion call to fight for freedom in a distant land, they at first, at least, eagerly followed him. They knew well what he was talking about because they had been weaned on these very liberal values. All Americans are liberals, by the way. Uh, people who are flying planes into buildings are what are not liberal in the world. All Americans are part of the liberal tradition, uh, even, even conservatives like me. Um, but anyway, Davy uh, uh, inspired that whole generation, but he also inspired the generation that was protesting the war after President Kennedy uh, was killed. And um, we only have to go to James Coonan's account of the, uh, of the seizure of Columbia University by, by anti-war radicals in, uh, in the 60s. Uh, in his book, The Strawberry Statement, he wrote, he was sitting in the president's desk at Columbia University, and he was going to have to write a letter to his father on the president of the university stationery that seized the administration building, uh, explaining to him why he was uh, taking all of his father's money and uh, engaging in riots. And um, I realized, he wrote, that my conception of the philosophy of law came not so much from Rousseau, so much for all that money for college, but from Fess Parker as Davy Crockett. I remember him saying that you should decide what you think is right and then go ahead and do it. Walt Disney really bagged that one. The old fascist inadvertently created a whole generation of radicals. Well, God bless Walt Disney. There you go. Uh, well, the Disney craze had passed, but not Davy. Uh, he, he, he lived on uh, with Cindy Carson as Polly Crockett in Frontier Woman, daughter of Davy Crockett in 1956, which, by the way, uh, was the very first uh, uh, role for little Ronnie Howard, who uh, always retained his, his fascination with Davy Crockett because of this. His dad, Rance, who was a, a character actor, also was in the, in the film and brought Junior along. Um, James Griffith had a uh, cameo as Davy in uh, The First Texan with Joel McRae as Sam Houston from Allied Artist in 1956. Uh, 
And uh, then, of course, came the last command from 1955 from uh, Republic Studios uh, about, uh, about, of course, the siege of the Alamo with Jim, Jim uh, Bowie, as played by Sterling Hayden, as the uh, central character of the story. Now, uh, John Wayne had long wanted to make a movie about the Alamo, and he had developed a script and, uh, at Republic Pictures that was his studio. And um, with these, but he left the studio over the fact that they wouldn't finance the budget necessary to make the film. And uh, uh, when Disney's show was so successful, they rushed the film into production. And uh, Arthur Honeycutt plays a, plays a gr grizzled, bearded uh, Davy Crockett. And uh, um, Sterling and Hayden is, of course, uh, is of course Jim Bowie's nice uh, view of the set. You see how inexpensive the film was. They didn't build the uh, chapel at all in the uh, in the movie. And this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie: uh, the line in the mud. They didn't do the line in the dust. They did they did it in a rainstorm. And here you see them uh, hosing down the defenders of uh, of the Alamo at the uh, at the time. Which, of course, brings us to uh, John Wayne's great epic. Uh, which, of course, had been his lifelong uh, dream. The Alamo, Wayne declared in 1960, was made up of men and women who believe that in order to live decently, one must be prepared to die decently. They believed in freedom. They believed it was something worth fighting for, worth dying for. Um, Wayne wanted to convince uh, all Americans and the whole world of the necessity to stand up for freedom against the uh, uh, spread of communism. And uh, the Alamo became a uh, metaphor uh, for that. There's his uh, sprawling set at Brackettville, the same place Last Command was made. Uh, after a year of production, some $12 million, and a massive publicity campaign orchestrated by Russell Birdwell, who had handled the uh, publicity for Gone with the Wind, Wayne's epic premiered in San Antonio in October 1960. At three hours and 18 minutes, it tested the patience of even the most dedicated Texas patriot. And, uh, not me. I, uh, I, I, I watch the uncut version and uh, cringe. Um, it, uh, I, love, I love this movie, uh, and uh, I love a lot of really bad movies. Uh, and uh, alas, this one does, though, have its moment. Uh, it, it was such a colossal bomb and failed uh, with the critics that he cut a half hour out of it just and just kind of yanked it out. So it, uh, the version you see today is, uh, has been cut, although I've seen the uncut version and you're not missing anything, let me assure you. Um, and for all its uh, epic qualities, the, it's still just a lavish remake of, uh, of The Last Command. And um, in both films, Davy Crockett dies um, uh, John Ford visited, dies blowing up the powder magazine. John Ford visited the set, and there's a big debate over how much he, uh, he had a hand in it. I don't think much because uh, of the quality of the film, which I love. Let me get that right. Here's Bowie's death from, uh, from the film, uh, from the angle of the crew. And there, of course, is Davy Crockett uh, uh, being run through with a spear. It's a, and then he blows up the chapel, the only part of the Alamo still standing. Oh, what the hell. Um, <laughs> And there's Santa Ana on his white horse. Um, the Alamo returned on television, the Time Tunnel in 1966, uh, but alas, no Davy uh, in the, that TV show, a Hanna-Barbera cartoon in 1977. Uh, Disney tried to bring him back in 1988 in a four-part series on Disneyland, on the wonderful world of color on NBC. Didn't work. 86, Mac Davis played him in Showtime on Shelley Duvall's Tall Tales. Uh, and then, of course, in 1987, uh, Lon Tinkle's book was adapted into The Alamo. Brian Keith, who you would think would be a perfect Davy Crockett, note a change in headgear. They wanted to make them, themselves different. Um, um, he was just, uh, he, he just kind of phoned it in. I think he was ill at the time. Of course, The Alamo uh, still playing today at the IMAX Theater on the River City Center Mall. If you want to know what those boys at The Alamo died for, all you have to do is go to the River Center Mall and see the glories of American capitalism right there. There you go. Um, and Merrill Connolly uh, played uh, Davy. He was, of course, the uh, brother of the governor. And uh, uh, Bill Daniels had been in John Wayne's movie, and he was the brother of the governor. So that seems to be a trend. Naked Gun Two and a Half, of course, all uh, with David Zucker as, uh, as Davy Crockett. Uh, 
and uh, John Snyder in James Michener's Texas in 1994, there in the middle with an animal on his head. And not to mention, not to forget, when the History Channel used to be about history, uh, I actually wrote a two-hour special on Davy Crockett uh, that Gary Foreman uh, directed with Mark Baker in 2001, available uh, on Amazon. I don't get a penny. And then, of course, the Alamo in 2004, which we're going to uh, hear uh, discussed in some detail later. So. Uh, uh, I won't go into it, but I did want to. I did want to show Frank's novel because I knew he'd be here. Y yes, Frank, and uh, and I am a character in the novel, and thus, thus I and I always deeply appreciated that. Billy Bob Thornton made a very uh, believable Crockett, and uh, uh, there he is with John Hancock. There's the money scene from uh, from the movie. Here's the death scene. It was kind of. Uh, it's fine when Chris stands up. I know I've got to go, but it's uh, it was uh, this uh, death scene was kind of melancholy for me because I had long argued, along with Professor Chris, that Davy Crockett had indeed been captured and ex executed at the Alamo, and then to see it on the screen uh, made me feel kind of sad and bad about myself. Um, and there I am uh, with John Hancock, the director, and some local writer from, um, from some magazine in Austin photobombed me in that picture. It's really annoying. Um, he also got me to uh, write uh, a piece for Texas Monthly Magazine in 1986 on Davy Crockett that became something of, a, uh, something of a sensation and led to death threats coming to my New Mexico office. And so I like to end all Davy Crockett talks with uh, the favorite letter I've ever received in my life. And this is uh, even better than some of the uh, uh, hot e emails I received from Professor Crisp. Um, this is from uh, Virginia Bird of All Good Tennessee. And she was reacting to my Texas Monthly article, which I thought was so hagiographic and so loving about Crockett that no one would be upset. But of course, I did say that he was captured and executed, because it's the truth, uh, at the Alamo. And Harrigan smiled and said, don't you worry, boy. Uh, this will be perfect. Uh, so here's the letter. Paul Andrew Hutton. No dear. Why don't you find something or somebody to write about? You call it research. Besides Americans who are, this is underlined, real men. Not like you gutless wonders of today who call yourselves men. Sure you wear pants, so what? You could never stand up and do the things Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, Andrew Jackson, and many other real men did. I shudder to think what our country would have been had we not had these brave, fearless, it's underlined again, men, to lead us this far. My nephews still have their coonskin caps that I bought them years ago, and they love the history about the adventures of those days. What would you have the kids of today have for their heroes? The long-haired, dirty, stinking, foul-mouthed noisemakers who call themselves singers but really are a bunch of garbage? <laughs> Historians, it's in quotes, Historians such as you could never measure up to these great, and you know it's underlined, great men, so stop trying. Thank you, Virginia Bird, and thank you, everyone. I think my favorite comment on uh, this kind of stuff was about the time Texas Rising came out. The History Channel, you may recall, quit calling themselves the History Channel. They just started calling themselves History. And a friend of mine, I can't remember who now, said, no, they, just, they should just call themselves Channel. <laughs> <laughs> Since they're doing ancient aliens and ice truckers and stuff like that. We're going to have lunch now. And we'll start again when lunch is over. And I'll warn you, thank you very much, audience and speakers. <laughs>